like this. Yeah. <laughs> well, this. This is going to be fun. We're going to learn all about what the commercial fishing group, what they go through to capture all these free fish in the Lake Michigan. <laughs> um, our guest tonight is uh, Dennis Hickey from Bates Park. And uh, Dennis has been fishing over 50 years. some time in California learning to be a butcher, I guess. He also took courses in management at UCLA. And um, eventually he decided to return to Door County. And he and his brother Jeff established Hickey Brothers Fishery. After many years chasing whitefish, trout, and walleyes, and even perch on Lake Michigan, <laughs> Jeff retired from business and Dennis became the man in charge. Now Dennis is just anticipating his own retirement, but um, Todd Stewie, his son-in-law, who married his daughter, isn't that convenient? Um, <laughs> will probably take over, but um, I, I expect Dennis will be on board a, a lot of times uh, helping out work with him. Um, Dennis is more than just a Lake Michigan fisherman. He's also sought by fishing interests Western states, and he and his group have sometimes moved to Utah or, or, Utah, or Wyoming for a short period of time to help correct imbalances in populations of fish. Before closing, I should note that the Hickey Brothers and Bailey's Harbor has a retail outlet for fresh or flash frozen fish. I saw Dennis yesterday and left with a couple of very fresh white fish, and Francis Boyle them. Last night, I discovered that there was something special about Hickey Brothers whitefish. These were the best whitefish I've ever had in Door County, really. I don't know what he does to make his fish special, but I suspect uh, the way they, they're gentle with them when they remove them from the nets or something like that. But they were very good fish. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce uh, Dennis Hickey to you, and we'll tell some fish stories. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Uh, we get a, a lot of people in the shop, and, and uh, I get a lot of questions about commercial fishing through the course of a year, and, and uh, I'll try and touch on some of the things and how uh, the fishery was and how it is now. And, and over the years, it has changed a lot just since we have fished. And uh, uh, I think uh, that a lot of people don't realize that it's uh, a corporate type fishery now and not the fish tug that leaves at daylight in the morning and goes chugging along with a Kallenberg engine and uh, it comes in with the seagulls following and uh, dressing fish and, and uh, new regulations and laws and everything uh, don't allow it and just plain uh, the way uh, businesses operate now uh, it can't be that way anymore. Although we still have the boats, and they still uh, do it in a little bit different way. A little faster, and probably bigger boats, and, and uh, the, the processing and everything is more streamlined, uh, more uh, inspection and everything. Uh, and about 20 years ago, uh, the state of Wisconsin passed uh, Senate Bill 409, which was called a, a limited entry uh, bill for commercial fishing and uh, uh, what it did is it uh, allowed the DNR to set the overall uh, allowable catch of each species of fish and it uh, divided the lake up into three different zones and each commercial fisher was uh, given a percentage of the total allowable catch of each species uh, according to what their history of uh, catch was. So in other words, 
Uh, we fished a lot of live entrapment nets, big pond nets, so we probably had a bigger uh, quota percentage than uh, some of the fishermen that only had a boat and only fished uh, maybe part-time or something like that. But with that, uh, every fisherman was allowed to either buy or sell. In other words, the whole idea was to either get big or sell out, you know, and try and make it easier for uh, Wisconsin DNR to manage the fishery and also to enforce uh, the fishery. And so uh, we're about 20 years into this now, and uh, I think my brother and I have probably bought out, uh, I don't know exactly, probably about 30 other fishermen. And uh, uh, we're down now, the state of Wisconsin is down to between 50, maybe uh, 52, 53 fishermen, or licenses. But that still isn't uh, the total number of fishermen because like in our uh, fishery, we maintain uh, four licenses. And the reason is because you have to have a license for each boat. We actually run six boats here in Wisconsin, but uh, we can transfer a license in the winter from uh, an open boat to an a enclosed boat if we want to. And uh, so we don't need a, a license for each one uh, if we take the license off of one of the other ones and put it on a different one. But uh, the overall fishery now, most of the fisheries that are left uh, maintain uh, more multiple licenses. So you're probably only talking in the state of Wisconsin now maybe 15 real fish rigs uh, that exist. In Door County, there's uh, three what we call live entrapment fisheries. And uh, those three live entrapment fisheries uh, probably hold about 75% of the, the uh, Wisconsin quota uh, for whitefish. Uh, live entrapment is like uh, huge minnow traps that are set uh, with anchors. Uh, the pots, uh, the average would be uh, a 30 foot in other words, 30 foot high, 40 feet long, and uh, 22 feet wide, and with a 1,000 foot lead that goes towards shore. So they're massive gear, and it takes uh, big equipment uh, to handle them and, and good sized crews, but it is the Cadillac way to fish. Once you get them set, and, and it is an expensive way to fish too, it's not cheap to uh, maintain and, and build these big nets, uh, but there's, like I say, three, three fishermen, uh, one on the end of uh, the Door Peninsula, one in Sand Bay, and then uh, ourselves that, uh, that fish the live entrapment uh, fishery up here. And uh, uh, most, I would say, of the fish this time of the year uh, are all sold uh, locally uh, for the fish boils and the restaurants and, and everything. And uh, what we've done, uh, uh, the area is cut into three different zones. So you have from uh, Bailey's Harbor and south is uh, zone three. That's one whole area. And from uh, uh, Bailey's Harbor to all the way around the peninsula to uh, Chambers Island is zone two. And then zone one is Southern Green Bay. Uh, uh, by buying out other fishermen in various uh, zones, we've been able to uh, fish, we have quota in all different zones. Uh, the other, my brother and I have always felt that uh, the best way to stabilize our fishery was to be diversified. And uh, by doing that, we, we also fish gill nets, we have gill net boats, uh, we have trap nets, and we also were the, uh, some of the last uh, fishermen uh, on uh, Lake Michigan to fish the, the pond nets. The big stake nets that you see probably over by Caney Island or out in North Bay, those were our nets. Uh, the last three years we haven't set any of those because it's been such bad weather in the fall that, uh, and we also had uh, uh, caught uh, fish over in zone one with uh, trap nets, so we felt we'd just stay on that side of the peninsula instead of fighting the weather over in the lakeside and uh, until the end of the season. Now. Every year, uh, we're given uh, uh, one individual quota, whatever our percentage is, and we're given this book. And I know people have said to me, well, you got a quota, it's, uh, it's easy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, how, do, how do you keep track of that? You know, you guys could slide fish or, or whatever. But uh, every day, 
This, this has to be filled out. We have to estimate our catch. And on it, uh, I'll turn around and go right down the line. Uh, you have the day, the grid zone. There's every, every space in the lake is, is set up on a grid zone. And you have to put the grid zone that you're lifting in, the type of gear, uh, the amount of effort, in other words, the, the number of nets that you lifted, uh, the number of nights that it was out. So if you didn't lift it yesterday, then it'll be two nights, or uh, you can only leave them five nights and you have to be back there. Uh, and then uh, the, the type of gear, uh, the mesh size, that would be, for whitefish, should be four and a half or, or bigger. You can't be under four and a half. And it, uh, then they want to know what the bottom range is from how many fathoms to how many fathoms. And then your estimated catch. And this has to be filled out before you get to the dock. Because if a warden stops you uh, without it filled out, you could uh, you get a fine, a good fine, and you'll probably lose your license because this is a major offense. So that's, that's one of the ways they, they stop anybody trying to cheat on the quotas. This gives the DNR absolute uh, uh, ability to manage the, the fish stocks. Uh, we, uh, we have a quota, uh, like I said, in uh, zone one, two, and three. So uh, we can move around and we, we do do that uh, according to the time of the year. We know uh, uh, that in the spring and summer, it's probably better to fish over on the Green Bay side for whitefish until right about now, the water starts to get warm when we start to get this warm weather. And whitefish like cool water. So they're gonna start to move back up around this way. So uh, as we get uh, toward the end of, uh, uh, oh, I'd say uh, the end of August, we'll, we'll move back to the uh, North Bay, Moonlight Bay side and all the Bailey's Harbor again on that side. Uh, some of the other guys have stayed over in the lake all summer, and, and they did do pretty good down by Whitefish Bay and along on that side. But overall, I think uh, we probably did better over in, in Zone 1 over on the Green Bay side. But the, the catches now are coming down uh, uh, somewhat, and I think it's because of water temperature. It's very important to keep track of your weather and water temperatures because that, that's pretty much how the fish move. Over the years, you get used to uh, being able to follow the fish uh, by doing that. Uh, we, we also fish gill nets. Uh, we fish uh, with our gill net boats. That's the enclosed ones like, uh, yeah, like this one. Uh, that's the traditional one that everybody thinks of as the commercial fishermen in Door County. And uh, those we use mostly in the winter. But some of, there is two fishermen that, that do run, uh, two or three that run gill net boats in the summer up here, but uh, uh, mostly uh, we like the enclosed boats for the winter. You can break ice and, and uh, travel. But also if the weather gets too bad, like the last few years, uh, we, we fish under the ice over on Green Bay, and uh, we can run nets that way also. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we like to try and uh, continue to fish year round, uh, <coughs> with the exception uh, the season closes for spawning for the month of November. Uh, that allows the whitefish to spawn. And the major spawning grounds are in North Moonlight Bay. Uh, if you look at a, a chart of Lake Michigan, the only uh, uh, real harbors or anything uh, with uh, rock shoreline in that is the Door Peninsula, starting down by Whitefish Bay Point. And then you have each harbor. And the reason for that, the, the fish first like the honeycomb rock to spawn on and then uh, they like the little harbors so that they, uh, when the fry uh, hatch, they go in there and uh, feed on plankton in those harbors. And if you look at the rest of Lake Michigan, there aren't any shelters for the small fry to go into. So uh, that's why it's very important to protect our, our harbors and that in, in Door County. Now there's a lot of regulations that go along with, with our catch report. The catch report has to be filled out when we come in uh, every day, uh, and estimate catch has to be, and then it has to be refilled when we actually weigh the fish, and then it's sent to the DNR every two weeks. And then uh, it's, it's, they take it, and then they, they cross-reference it with wholesalers and any sales slips that we have. Uh, but we also have other, uh, many other laws. Uh, we can't fish inside of a quarter mile. We have to stay outside of a quarter mile. 
You can't fish in any harbors. You have to stay outside of all the harbors. Uh, we, uh, again, have the closed season for spawning, and we have a uh, size limit. A whitefish has to be 17 inches long or we have to release it. And that's why we like uh, fishing uh, live entrapment nets. I don't think many people realize that uh, we probably only take 10% of all the fish we catch in our live entrapment nets that we actually take home. The rest we let go. We, uh, the reason is we could catch enough fish when we, when we set our nets that we could fish ourselves out of business. So we, we would be done probably by the end of June. But we don't want to do that because we want to maintain uh, fish for the restaurants and the shop and also our wholesalers, you know, that will take uh, fish in the fall. The other reason is uh, in zone two we like to save quota because uh, we can get more dollar value out of our fish in the fall because we get the golden caviar out of them in, uh, say, the end of September through the month of October. And that uh, is uh, an important thing. We can almost double the value of our fish by uh, uh, taking the golden caviar or the eggs, and uh, then we process them and we export to Sweden and Norway. Uh, we also uh, have, at times, exported uh, the whitefish to Sweden and Norway. They, they really like uh, the whitefish for smoking over there. They'll uh, uh, put uh, a small whitefish, 17-inch, on a... Uh, uh, or two or three of them at the smokehouse, they'll put them on a, a little platter and they sell them at the delis and that. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's really sought after. But uh, the last few years, we've, we've needed everything that we produce right, right here in, in the U.S. We also, when we uh, get into our heavier catches and then uh, the uh, tourism lets up a little bit in uh, late fall in the Door Peninsula, then we ship uh, fish. Uh, a lot goes to New York, uh, Chicago, and LA and some to Florida. We ship all over the US and uh, uh, we also uh, freeze and uh, also uh, for uh, uh, smoker markets and uh, I think there's one in Pennsylvania and uh, <coughs> various uh, places that might want fish when fish get scarce. When we uh, fish on the ice in the winter, one of the things that I've been working at trying to uh, get the law changed uh, our law right now reads that we have to uh, leave the ice on the 15th of March. And uh, if you remember the last few years, the weather, uh, we had four and a half feet of ice out there on the 15th of March. And it also was uh, during Lent. And a lot of our restaurants got pretty upset over it that uh, we had to leave. And uh, DNR's uh, reason for it is they said, well, Maybe the ice would break up and, and you guys would leave all your nets, you know. But that's obsolete thinking because uh, we've got uh, modern electronics like anybody else. We've all got boats. We go right, uh, we know where the nets are. We go right back and get them. And besides that, they're pretty expensive to leave out there, you know. Uh, there, there was a problem, though, with what they call them ghost nets. Uh, uh, I think uh, some of your tribal fishermen over on uh, out of Fairport and over there have uh, uh, left nets in the past and they drift all over the place and, and uh, so there was problems but they're, they're kind of, uh, I think that this last year there probably was only five or six commercial fishermen that fished on the ice. So it wouldn't be that difficult to, uh, my proposal is if we can just decide ourselves when we're going to leave the ice, uh, we'll put a metal tag right on the net so if you find a ghost net you know whose net it is, the tag will be on there, and then there's a law is already in place that the fine structure and everything, if you have uh, nets over a certain, uh, it has to be two nights, you have to lift your gill nets. Uh, if they're over two nights, well then you know who it is, and uh, you can find them or whatever. The law is already in place. And that. So I, I'm still working on it, but they, they're bound to determine. Uh, it's not easy to get anything if you're a commercial fisherman. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, oh, I, I think that that covers some of the, the major uh, part of our, our laws. Uh, I think uh, size limit is a, uh, is a big issue. I know uh, quite often uh, the wardens will stand and, and uh, when we come with fish and watch to see if we have any sub We call them sublegals. Uh, but the sport fishery can take uh, any size white fish. In the last few years, uh, they have generated a, 
a substantial sport fishery over on the Green Bay side here on the ice. And uh, uh, they don't really do any reporting and uh, they don't have any size limits. They do have a, a bag limit, but they, uh, there's a lot of fishermen that are out there almost every day. And there's a lot of guides. In fact, the DNR doesn't even know how many guides are taking people out sport fishing on the ice. Uh, they sell guides licenses, but a guide license will let you go take people hunting at the same time. And so uh, they don't know if they're guiding for just uh, taking people out on ice or, or for uh, sport fit or hunting or, or whatever. And so I think the DNR is gonna have to, with the amount that they've been taking, because there's on a good weekend, there could be several thousand sport fishermen out on the ice taking whitefish now, up to 15 whitefish a piece, any size. And, and we don't like it because we're, we don't like to see the fish under 17 inches being caught because the reason for us not to take them is that a fish should spawn at least once and hatch uh, before you harvest it. And not only that, if it's under 17 inches, it won't give you an eight ounce fillet and most restaurants wanna serve at least an eight ounce fillet. You don't want a real small uh, fillet, but mostly we wanna save the stocks. The other uh, problem that uh, we have uh, is an issue with the amount of walleyes that we've got uh, on Green Bay side that are reproducing naturally now. The DNR tried uh, for years planting them and uh, the city uh, or the, the state of, of Michigan plants uh, a million in Bay to Knock and a, a million in Little Bay to Knock and they can't feed them all. They used to have a lot of perch up there and everything, they're pretty well eating those all up and they swim right down our shoreline, right past Marinette and up the Fox River and in the spring, it's quite a sport fishery. Everybody gets excited, they're catching walleyes and releasing them and catch 30, 40 walleyes a day. Everybody's really happy about it. But they, when they release the big ones and everything, they think they're helping it spawn. Well, they don't need that many for spawning because they're, they're getting real good uh, natural reproduction now anyhow. And uh, uh, the thing about it is those walleyes come back off of uh, spawning and they go back out and they feed on the smaller walleye, eat the perch on Green Bay, and the bigger uh, walleye are eating the whitefish. And we, we documented this this year, and I've, I've noticed it over the years, but it really got uh, serious this year. When we lift our trap nets that are in 80, 90 feet of water, the uh, 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 walleye's uh, uh, bladder expands pretty fast when it comes to the surface in our trap nets. And what it does is it squeezes the stomach, and, and it squeezes out all the... Uh, half digested whitefish. So we see that the small whitefish like that are floating all over in the water around us if we have many walleyes. The more walleyes you have, the more half digested whitefish you'll see. So I've had DNR out there with me, and the biologists know it, but the fishery is highly political right now, and there's a lot of sport pressure to more walleyes. Everybody wants walleyes, you know, and, and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with having a, a sport fishery with uh, walleyes, but too many, they're eating up our perch. Every, a lot of people like the perch, too. Yeah. And a lot of people come in our shop wanting perch, and we have just a small quota, and that's because of it. We are getting real good hatches on perch every year, down by Swamico and Pestigo and all those little rivers along there, but they don't survive because the, the small walleye that are about like that are feeding on, on the small fry perch, and, uh, and they, when they, uh, the walleye get bigger, and, and a lot of people don't see walleye like that every day. We see them every day in, in our big trap nets. And the thing is, uh, they feed on, on the bigger uh, uh, whitefish. And it's not uncommon to uh, see three, four, five uh, uh, small whitefish in a, a, a walleye. And then what's happening is, and I, uh, I don't know if we mentioned that. I, uh, I represented Wisconsin on the Great Lakes Fishery Commission for about 35 years now, and I'm an advisor there. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, have noticed, uh, and our biologists have told us too, that in the fall, when we fish on the bay side, or on the lake side again, uh, that a lot of the big walleyes are moving out into the lake and moving down in the lake. And the biologists all tell me that that's a sign that uh, it's overcrowding on the bay side, walleye population, and that they're looking for new territory. And so I think last September, 
the first week or so uh, before the whitefish run really started on the lake side, we had our nets in there a little bit early. We actually caught more pounds of walleyes, big walleyes in our live entrapment nets than we had whitefish, you know, out in the lake. And, and there's, I don't think there's a handful of people out there that even try and catch a walleye out there. They don't even realize they're out there. But the thing is, those, they'll be out there feeding on perch and whitefish out there too. And uh, a big walleye like that probably could be, uh, you know, 15, 20 years old. They, they uh, grow it quite a bit. So that's one of my big concerns uh, that, that's going on. Uh, and like I say, it's highly political because the sport fishery, uh, I'm sure there's people that feel there aren't nearly enough walleyes yet. They'd like more. You know, so uh, uh, the other concern that we have out on the lakeside, and that, uh, that uh, enters into our chub situation. Uh, the last few years, I know we are constantly having people ask, do you guys have smoked chubs? Why don't you have smoked chubs? Well, the population is way down on uh, chubs. And uh, the main reason is that the zebra mussels have uh, uh, filtered the inshore uh, uh, plankton and, and, and feed and the mices that the uh, uh, chubs are dependent on. And uh, uh, the uh, chubs have moved to deeper water. But then along came the quagga mussel. So we have two types of zebra mussels. And they're the deep water zebra mussel. So uh, they, they have invaded uh, chub grounds now too. But with that, in the meantime, the salmon have depleted the alewife population, which was the original intent, to plant the salmon to try and uh, get rid of the alewife. And they've gotten pretty much all the smelt too. So now they're looking for something else to eat and now, instead of, DNR was always pretty sure that they had everything under control when they planted salmon. But that was because they could either cut back on the planting or not. But now we've got three rivers in Michigan that put out salmon naturally. And we also have Lake Huron that has a lot of natural reproduction on salmon. And they're coming through the Mac because we have more forage base. And they're coming into Lake Michigan. So we're in the commercial fishery real worried that uh, we're going to lose all our chubs to uh, the salmon forage. And, uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, is constantly planting lake trout. They want to restore the native fish to lake trout, which is uh, the way to manage a lake. But the unfortunate thing, when we had good lake trout populations, uh, they, one of the feed uh, forage base fish for the lake trout was chubs too. So now we got, uh, a program that everybody in fish and wildlife is, uh, wants to get the lake trout back uh, and uh, try and get natural reproduction, which in the last two or three years they are seeing some natural reproduction. So they're going to eat chubs and also the salmon, which are uh, an exotic out there. And now, uh, when I say they're out of control, the DNR doesn't <coughs> like that. But they really are. If they can't control you know, how many they have, they're out of control. And uh, uh, I think I probably notice some of this stuff a lot more than maybe other fishermen because, uh, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, uh, my brother and I, uh, uh, like I said before, I, we wanted to diversify. So we started uh, fishing uh, in the inland Northwest, uh, helping uh, uh, some of the uh, agencies out there uh, restore some of their lakes that had problems. The first lake we worked on was uh, uh, Lake Pond Array in Idaho. It's up in the Panhandle. And their problem was the lake trout uh, that were in there were eating up all their kokanee salmon. And the kokanee salmon were the main uh, uh, feed for their cameloops or their big rainbow uh, uh, world-class uh, fishery for rainbow trout. And uh, so they wanted to restore it back to bull trout and uh, kokanee salmon and native species. So uh, uh, we, we looked at the lake. It, it was a real challenge to start moving full-size fish tugs, full-size fish rig and everything out there. But we said, what the heck, we'll give it a whirl. And uh, we, we moved out there uh, with a whole rig. And uh, it took us about uh, eight to 10 years and uh, we, we actually uh, brought the lake trout population down with the big live entrapment nets because we, then we could let 
uh, the, the bull trout and uh, all the species that they, they wanted to leave in the lake go and just take out the lake trout. And uh, now uh, the kokanee salmon have come back to the point where uh, they haven't seen that in 20 years, uh, that many kokanee salmon running in the rivers. All the people are happy again. It's kind of like if we had lots of perch on Green Bay. And uh, <laughs> since then, we've been involved in a lot of projects. Uh, and in fact, we're working on one in Yellowstone Park right now. Uh, again, taking the lake trout out to save the, the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And we've been there three years now. And uh, already, uh, there are signs that the cutthroat trout are starting to run in some of the rivers in uh, Yellowstone Park. And uh, the grizzly bears and the wolves, again, will be uh, feeding on them. But uh, uh, we use, there we use gill nets. And uh, I don't have the numbers uh, today. I forgot to ask my son-in-law. My son-in-law has taken over all the western uh, contracting, and, and also he will take over the fishery here in, in uh, Wisconsin, too. But I'm still there, and, and uh, uh, I work on all the different projects and, and uh, wherever wherever they need help, uh, I do it. But uh, uh, I, I have no doubt that we will win uh, uh, in Yellowstone uh, Park. Uh, I'm sure that there are well over 100,000 fish since uh, probably the first week of June that they took out of there. And that's fish by number, that's not pounds. You know, so uh, we have uh, gillnet boats there. We have three gillnet boats and uh, the park has one that they were running for about eight years before we got there. And uh, while they were fishing, they were losing ground all the while. And uh, since we've been there, now uh, we've turned the whole program around. In fact, they had us take their boat and remodel it so that it was a decent fishing boat. Uh, it wasn't set up r right to really do some production fishing. And uh, we, run, we staff that boat and run that boat along with uh, three of our own full-size gillnet boats. They're, they're gillnet boats like this that are out there. And we trans, uh, uh, reworked them all and uh, bought them and, and sent them out from here on semis. And that's the size boats we're using. Those same boats like that are what we're using in, in uh, inland northwest to fishing uh, uh, trap nets and, and that for our fishing. We, uh, we've got five different lakes and uh, four of them uh, we've uh, got that. In fact, I, I just uh, this week, I found out if anybody knows about Swan Lake in, in uh, Montana, that lake uh, is right below Glacier Park. That was overrun with lake trout and they wanted to get kokanee salmon back and they, they uh, sent us some uh, pictures of sportsmen with their catch of uh, kokanee salmon uh, just in the last week. And so, uh, and also Upper Priest Lake, that's in northern Idaho over by uh, the state of Washington. That one, uh, the bull trout, uh, the red counts are way up. And uh, so we're, we've won that one too. So uh, uh, we uh, also have uh, had uh, a lot of requests from uh, the state of Illinois and Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources and to help them with Asian carp. But uh, we, uh, we just don't uh, have the, the manpower and want to get spread that far to, to go to Illinois. However, we have, for the last three years, been uh, designing and stringing them nets. And we've designed them some nets that uh, catch Asian carp like crazy. But they're, what they're after is to try and uh, uh, get some commercial fishermen that are willing to fish those nets now and actually uh, try and reduce the Asian carp in, in, the, uh, in the river systems down there so that they don't eventually get into the Great Lakes. And so uh, uh, two or three times a year, we have crews that go down there and help them set the nets and, and uh, we string the nets. And, and we've also uh, built boats for a lot of these agencies and that too, and set them up properly so that they can actually do it on their own. And I think we're kind of leaning in that direction that uh, if somebody has a, a lake that's got a problem, We'll act, as, in fact, we're doing that on Flathead Lake in Montana now, to act as a consultant to the Kalispell Indian tribe. And uh, we set them up with boats, nets, and uh, processing equipment. And they're trying to uh, 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 develop a, uh, a business on their own and uh, let them uh, do their own fishing. Because it, it's really hard to uh, maintain boats 
all over in different states and, and uh, keep track of everything and crews and everything. But uh, we, can, we can help them uh, get the job done. Um, I could probably branch into a bunch of other things, but I think maybe uh, I threw out enough stuff that uh, if uh, I took some questions, then I could, I could uh, angle into some things. The, uh, uh, the uh, sack fry, whitefish, they're just tiny. They still have a little yellow sack on them. They'll come into the harbors, like in the Bailey's Harbor on the sand beach. That's the other thing you need. You need a, like a sand beach in the center of the harbor. And, and you think about that in Door County. We have that on all of our, our little harbors up here. And they go in there and they feed on that plankton in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the whitefish as a sack fry, right after he hatches. This year they were hatching already in, in late March and April. And even by our dock over there in Bailey's Harbor, they come in there just thick. They'll be just black in the water just coming in there. You know. Yeah, and it's, it's really important to protect these harbors and have good quality water and uh, everything for them. So, yeah. yeah. That's, that's another question I get asked a lot. Uh, that's uh, that and what time do you leave in the morning? But uh, uh, the thing is, uh, we, we can put, uh, we get up one quota a year, and uh, it comes out the first of January. And we, we, the only thing, we can't fish it in, in during the spawning season. But we can choose to fish it however we want. If I wanted to put a whole bunch of live entrapment nets in, I could do that. And I, but then I'd fish my whole quota out, and I wouldn't have fish for the rest of the year. So now the fishery, most people think that a fisherman will go out there and try and catch everything he can. But we do it to a certain extent. We try and catch what we estimate we need. So we're fishing for a market, you know, and, and trying to utilize that uh, quota of fish and get maximum value out of it. Sure, uh, on the live entrapment nets, uh, if you, uh, you look at how, how open they are in the back, the net slides right up over the top of the boat, and we push all uh, the fish live, like uh, a big pen, right to one side, and then we open big slots in there, and we scoop them out with big scoop nets and into a measuring tray, and uh, then we pick out only what we want and just dump the rest right over the side, and then let them go. That's, that's why it's the preferred way. DNR would sooner have uh, all live entrapment if they could uh, get it. But in the wintertime, it's pretty hard to fish that. You know, uh, you get all iced up. We have fish like out west. Uh, I think uh, a boat just like that, looked just like that. I fished on Lake Pond Ray all winter long. And we'd have like three inches of ice on the deck. We'd be pounding it off and, and that icicles on the rail and, and everything. Uh, but it snows there sometimes, but it's across the continental divide. And it, doesn't last long. It's kind of like April here. But uh, it's still, it's cold trying to fish live and trap in the winter. So that's why we go either on ice or uh, break ice with uh, this boat will, will break ice if you want to fish all winter. That's, uh, this boat we normally use for chub fishing. You go 10 miles out in the winter time with that boat. But it's, uh, uh, you know, like right now, it's really, uh, we, we can't really catch enough fish, but I don't want to bother to put more uh, uh, nets in because we're helping some of the other fishermen get enough fish for their orders. And uh, I don't want to put more nets in there because I'm going to use up my quota to do it. And uh, so I don't want to do that. So it, it's a whole different line of thinking. It's, it's not quite like, uh, you know, you just get out there and give her. Yeah. You mentioned a number of invasives. How is Gobi? Actually, actually, gobies, I think, are uh, what's saving the whole sport and commercial fishery right now. Because both the whitefish, uh, bass, walleyes, uh, everything is eating gobies. And uh, there's places in the lake, probably southern Lake Michigan has, uh, and southern Green Bay has the highest goby populations. And I think that's partially why a lot of the uh, whitefish are uh, sticking to southern Green Bay a little bit farther right now. Uh, because of the goby. Were there all this white fishing uh, available to ice fishermen? I mean, it's only been, what, last 
uh, not, not sport fishing as much. And that's a whole new thing. And, and uh, the thing is, uh, I don't think the DNR has really got a handle on, on uh, what it, it, how it's exploded. If you want to look at ice fishing in Door County, if you never even thought about it, go to icefishing.com on the uh, internet. And you, you'll see pictures unbelievable, you know, that they're catching out there hook and line. And the reason they're able to do it is modern technology. Because uh, a lot of the, the sport fishermen have uh, cameras. They'll put it down, you know, and they'll go to 80 feet of water and then look down and look where the school of whitefish is. If it's not there, they go somewhere else, you know, and, and look again. Meantime, all their friends are out looking around too. Pretty soon, uh, somebody finds the school and they all get on the cell phone and call each other and they have portable <laughs> ice shanties. And they, yeah, that's really what happens. And not only that, in the last few years, uh, people can guide for $40. You can get a license. Anybody can do it. And they, in turn, there's guides that are taking 75 to 100 people a day out there. And they take them uh, with uh, uh, big snowmobiles on sleds, and uh, they're, they're hauling them out there one after the other. It, it's big business uh, right now. Do, do the movies no, I, it's surprising. Not like an ale life. An ale life, uh, you know, you get a kind of a bad taste, like in the trout and, and uh, whitefish. But uh, 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 they, they, the whitefish are really healthy, really thick, and uh, they get a nice thick belly fat and everything. They're in real good shape. And I think gobies are probably the biggest reason for it. Uh, they're, they're an exotic. They got probably brought in with ballast water, just like a lot of the other stuff we're taking. Oh, I think we've had them for probably 10 years now. They really uh, multiply too. Yeah. Um, sounds like from what it sounds like you're Well, we're, we have to stay outside the quarter mile. That's, uh, that's a lot, and you can't go in the harbors. But uh, we, we fish, uh, I have some nets on Green Bay that are in 90 feet of water, and uh, we can only go to 150 feet. There's a law on that. And the reason for that is you don't want to bring all those fish up uh, from uh, deep water uh, because it's hard on them. Uh, their bladders will, will bloat and, and they, they won't be able to get back down. Actually, I don't like the fish. Personally, I don't like the fish beyond 100 feet. I think it's too hard on the fish. Uh, it's just recently that they changed the law uh, to 150. It used to be 80 feet, and that was I was fine with that too. You know, I, I, you know, you, uh, that's another thing uh, that uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, commercial fishermen don't necessarily want to catch every last fish that they can because then your whole investment and your whole business is shot. You're done. You know, and, and I think that uh, a lot of times uh, sport groups think that commercial fishermen are really evil. You gotta get rid of every last one. And, and uh, <coughs> they have a whole different attitude because I think sport fishermen would sooner catch everything they could uh, sometime, most guys. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's different. And that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to come over and, and talk to everybody. It's, it's not quite like a lot of people think. I, I know that from just the questions I get asked you know, in the shop. Yeah. How long does it take a little sack fish to become 17 inches? How, uh, how they figure three like years old, but I think they're they're growing a little slower. They were the last few years a little slower. It might be seven years old now. Uh, but uh, it depends on where they are. I think that the ones that are in the bay there that are feeding heavy on gobies are growing faster. They're in nice shape. Yeah, uh, the uh, chubs that they're getting now, they're getting in deeper water and uh, they don't have the feed that they need. They got the quagua mussel out there and uh, they're, uh, they're eating a lot of the, uh, the mices is what we really need to get back. But our water quality is getting better. Uh, see, uh, by representing Wisconsin on the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, I get to sit uh, like I was at Ann Arbor in March in on all of the biologists' reports from all the Great Lakes and every species, everything that they do. And uh, 
uh, I find it interesting because then I can, can use it for long range planning in our own fishery. And uh, uh, they, they do feel that the water in the north end of Lake Michigan uh, is, is getting a little bit better you know, uh, in the last few years. One of our, our big problems with fishing on the lake side uh, is uh, uh, a lot of the exotic plants and everything that have, have moved in there. And uh, it's uh, uh, screwing up the whole uh, food chain there and everything for us. Well, uh, before we get out of here, you bought a very oh. unusual predator fish. I can, I can pass it along. And uh, the reason I brought it is because I, I don't know if anyone, it's, it's vacuum. But that's a lamprey, sea lamprey. Uh, being on the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, one of the main uh, uh, jobs of the Fishery Commission and the duty is to uh, uh, control the sea lamprey. And a lot of people think that the sea lamprey is eradicated. It's not. It's being controlled by uh, Funny, uh, funds and uh, monies that the Great Lakes Fishery Commission uh, uh, raises, and also the program is run from the commission to uh, monitor all the streams around the Great Lakes between, and it's a joint commission between U.S. and Canada, and uh, it uh, 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 they send out the crews in the spring and they check the streams for anisids. That's the little lamprey. They look like a little night crawler. And uh, streams that they find those in, then they'll put lamprecide in there. And uh, they, they rotate every stream all the way around all the Great Lakes. They check every one. And they spend, uh, I think it's about $4 million a year. They, they get funding. And we're always worried every year that uh, somebody in Washington is going to jerk that funding and, uh, because they don't know anything about the Great Lakes or they think that the uh, lamprey are uh, eradicated. They're under control, and they're doing a real good job. For about, uh, oh, this is about eight years ago now, uh, I used to go to every commission meeting, and we chump fished in the winter at them, and we were getting a lot of uh, uh, chubs. If you could imagine a fish that long with about six little lamprey marks, little tiny lamprey marks on it, and I vacuum those just like I did the lamprey, Take them to the commission, and I lay them on the desk in, in front of me, uh, and uh, everybody come along. Man, where did I, we didn't think uh, Lamprey would get on a little bitty chub? What it was, and I kept it up. They couldn't find where they were coming from, and I was doing it right out of Bailey's Harbor. That's where I was getting them. It turned out that the Manistee River over here uh, was had a hole in their dam. And they had gotten into the headwaters, and nobody had checked it for years, and they were just thick in there. So that is the biggest treatment of lamprey they've ever done up in there. It took, I, don't, uh, I don't know all the figures. I, I have it uh, at home. Uh, but it was a lot of lamprecide to uh, uh, treat that stream. And they treat that uh, every year now. Uh, for the last five, six years, they, they poured a lot of money in it. And it's made a tremendous difference on the amount of lamprey that we have on all our fish in Green Bay and around the Upper Door Peninsula. And so uh, the, the commission is always out there working. That's their number one job. And along with that is the uh, uh, coordinating of all the research and all the uh, various uh, uh, projects that are going on on Lake Michigan, then to share that with all the other biologists. And so that's why they have uh, the meetings twice a year for that. And it's, it's, it's really interesting, but it's, it's pretty intense. It goes on for a whole week to listen to all this. That's a lamprey, yes, a sea lamprey, yeah. Yeah, you'll see, on, you'll be able to look right at the, uh, on the one end there, the mouth. It's got like a little round suction. It attaches to the fish, and then it's got little teeth that work like a, a little saw. And it just grinds a hole right in our fish and it sucks the blood out of the fish and kills the fish. And it's very important to uh, make sure that those levels stay under control because uh, if we don't, uh, you'll lose not only the commercial fishery but the sport fishery too. Everything's dependent. I think a lot of people don't realize how the land reverse. Uh, in 20, 30, 40 years, they were just Yeah.
that's how the alewife wound up in the lake because it was so easy for them to just move right in uh, because the lake uh, had been pretty well uh, uh, decimated by uh, uh, the lamprey. But that in turn uh, uh, is one of the reasons why a lot of the, the lakes out west have lake trout <laughs> because uh, fish and wildlife took the lake trout out of Lake Michigan to try and save the strain and they took them to Lewis Lake uh, and in Wyoming and put them in there to save the strain and then they, they got spread around in all the lakes out there. So now we're out there fishing them to try and restore the lakes back. Yeah. No. No, we're, we're, uh, we're not all. No, uh, well, we fish live in trout, so they're all live, so we let them go. But see, uh, uh, the trout. When you're cleaning them. Oh, out west. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, out west, uh, yeah, uh, like on Lake Ponderay, we take them to the food bank. Um, in uh, Yellowstone and Glacier Park, uh, you can't exploit the resources of a national park, so. Uh, we take them out to the deepest point we can find and uh, we do the biology on them. We check them for male or female, uh, age them, uh, and uh, measure them, and uh, uh, then uh, we uh, dump them. And then uh, they, the park feels that, uh, uh, that they'll go down and then they'll uh, turn in the feed, uh, you know, uh, for the cutthroat trout. You know, uh, some of them uh, small invertebrates and that will start eating on them. So, so that's their, their uh, choice on it. But uh, various things, but we, we never take any of the fish because a lot of the lakes we're working on out there are in wilderness, you know, and uh, it would be really hard to, to get them out of there and everything. And so, uh, 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 like some of the lakes, so uh, the biologists rotate in and out that, that ride with us, and so they'll take coolers full of them and uh, take them back to the food banks. And that. So we try not to waste any if we can help. Oh, sure, sure. You can make them stick on your hand, but I've never had one actually, uh, you know, bite or chew on. But it, every once in a while, you see one of the guys on the boat will have one. Hey, I got one, you know, stick them on his hand. <laughs> every time. It doesn't make any difference. You know, a carp, a little bit less because the carp have big scales and real hard scales. But uh, a fish like a, a we call them lawyers, but they're freshwater codfish, burbot, uh, gobies. Uh, gobies, I, I haven't seen any lamprey marks on them, but I don't catch a lot of gobies because they're small. Yeah, but they're small, aren't they, about like that? Yeah, see, we have to fish four and a half inch twine, which is all like that, so a goby wouldn't, we couldn't catch it. The only way I see a goby is if it's in the stomach of a fish. <laughs> Uh, on the ocean, but not here in the lakes. Yet, we may have some. <laughs> uh, whitefish and, and salmon. Yeah. The two fish that I think both sport in commercial life. I don't know. That's a different story. Yeah. So, so far it is, but you never know what we'll come up with. <laughs> yeah. It's a freshwater codfish, or a burbot, or uh, they call it one. Dennis, can you go back to the years and tell us what a difference that was when you started that business? Well, the first thing, we started with a wooden boat. <laughs> uh, but we actually, at that time, uh, I think we were ahead of a lot of the guys. We had a Caterpillar engine in already. Uh, the twine that we fished, uh, we started gill netting. Uh, the twine that we fished uh, was uh, nylon and cotton with cotton meters. And now uh, it would be all monofilament uh, and synthetic meters. Uh, we fished uh, the same way though with the gill net boat. Set the nets the same and, and uh, 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 in the same places. Uh, probably couldn't break as much ice in the winter. Uh, didn't have uh, the boats couldn't handle it. And uh, then we, we were doing a lot of uh, uh, the steak nets or pond fishing net. And that's when we got into that. Why is it called that? 
in Parliament in Parliament here. Oh, that officially just falling apart. The question I had was, did he ever get afraid? Was he ever afraid of the modern storm? No. <coughs> you, you, when you're out in a storm, you don't have time, uh, time to uh, be afraid. You better get in. <laughs> you know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta worry about, you know, the boat and your crew and, and everything. You got, uh, you got other things to worry about. So. One more question. Yes. Yes. Would like to thank you I would think that they'll go right over to Green Bay, Southern Green Bay, yeah, because it's shallow, warm water, yeah, from what we've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Lake Superior is kind of banking on that. It. It'll be too cold for them to ever get there, but I don't know. They're, they can adapt, you know, pretty good, but uh, uh, I think the overall goal is to try and, uh, you know, uh, intercept them there in the rivers and trying to keep them from getting in. They wanted us already to uh, uh, contract to set uh, our trap nets off of Chicago to see if any of them are out there yet. But I, I didn't want to get into trying to fish by Chicago or, or anything. Like we got too many irons, irons in the fire and the trouble that you'd have there. <laughs> We we got people that have come for a long time. There and then their families come. So, uh, but you know we we never really advertise the retail part of it because we're actually a wholesale commercial fishery. You know, but we always felt that the people supported the fishery so well that they deserve to be able to buy fish. You know, right from the fishermen. And so we put the counter in there, and, and uh, that's why we do it. You know, so. If you have questions, you can ask Dennis after this is over. But. Uh,